everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Small Business Small Talk. I am your host, Christy Smallwood, and I am always super excited to share with you my new guests on a new episode because they're just awesome. I talk to awesome people. I don't just, I like, it's just awesome to be able to do this. If you ever get a chance to find the thing that you love to do and do it well, and I'm not getting paid to do this podcast, but that you can do consistently that makes a positive impact in the world, do that thing. Uh, Because this is, doing this podcast is one of the pieces that jazzes me all the time. I love the jazz of doing this. And all of my Gen Xers will know exactly what that phrase is from. Uh, but this podcast totally jazzes me. I love it. And I love you for showing up. I know that might seem a little, you know, too familiar, but I do appreciate all of our listeners out there from all over the place. You guys rock it because if you're listening to something like this in a day, that means you're looking to either start a business, you're in a business, you want your business to be better. You don't want to feel alone in your business. Your business might be driving you crazy and you just want to know other people get drove crazy with their businesses. It could be anything. So this podcast is all for those people in business who are like, I just need to find my tribe of other business owners. That's what small business, small talk does for you is I, I give you this platform and you can meet other business owners through these episodes to learn their backstories. What do they specialize in? What are their big key learnings? How do they, how do they help their clients, their customers? What impact are they making in the world? It's also to remind yourself what success really looks like. And the answer to that is it's not always about the money, hardly ever about the money. And that's another beautiful thing about small business. We do it because we love it. We love what we're doing. We love working with people. We love to make those impacts. And so that's, that's the feel good stuff about the intro of small business, small talk. I am your host. Like if I didn't already say it before, but my name is Christy Smallwood. So I'm headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky, the home of the Kentucky Derby. And we have a lot of bourbon around here, but little known fact, we also do the disco balls. That's right. We love to party in this town two weeks out of the year. We're for sure partying. And that is coming up in April. We started in April, two whole weeks of all kinds of parties leading up to a two minute race. That's kind of what we're known for around here. (laughs) It can get kind of wild and crazy. I don't actually, the funny thing is, is being from this area, I don't participate in all that kind of stuff, but it is fun to watch like from the sidelines. Uh, Everybody gets fancy, definitely closer to the Derby. The big hats come out, the plaid suits, the pastels, bow ties are everywhere. It's just a fun time to really spring it up because it's in spring. And so uh, every, all the flowers are blooming. It's just beautiful around here that time of year, no matter what else is going on in the world, it's, it's a good time. Now we're currently in January. (laughs) Weather sucks. I'm not the gray sky girl. I need to have plenty of sunshine preferably a beach or, you know, just a nice, nice breeze with a, a nice, comfortable place under a big oak tree and just kind of sit there and enjoy the day. That'd be awesome, but that's not what it's like. It's a very great day today as I'm recording this. Um, barely woke up because on mornings like this, that's hard. It's hard. I'm not the early riser as it is. My normal time is seven. And when I say early risers, I got friends who do get up at five. We don't talk to each other till eight. Like, don't talk to me before eight o'clock in the morning. I can't guarantee your safety. It's just one of those things. I need coffee first, Uh, caffeine, something. I may not, but just don't talk to me till then. This has been kind of my joke lately. That's not really a joke. Um, Don't know about you, but I kind of need that. However, this morning, I didn't need as much coffee because my guest today, I absolutely adore her. And I have for years now. Kara Saletto with Magnet Culture has been one of those people that I have like, I hope we're really friends because she's so awesome. And she's, she's younger than me. She's a millennial and I, I'm still, I'm so old. Oh my gosh. 
I'm 47 as of today. I'm, it's not my birthday, but in, in this day, I'm still in my 47th year. Now, I feel like anybody younger than me is like a child. And this is that state of life. I think we all kind of get to, it's hard to see somebody that's even 10 years younger as equals in experience of life, but she's got way more experience than I do in a lot of different things, especially focusing in her lane on training and speaking. And she started her business when she was 30 and the, how she was able to focus and it took off. Like it was, it was a perfect storm of the right message at the right time in the marketplace by the right person. And it, her business just took off really well. And then 2020 hit and she was able to also reposition herself in an even stronger message, an even more focused strategic way for her and her team. And I just, oh my gosh, she's amazing. I love her energy as it is. I love her background. I love just, she, she's an author and a speaker and I love how she created her business. Like everything about this person I very much admire and enjoy being around. And we talked for a good 30 minutes before we hit the record button. So we caught up with each other and our businesses. And I'm, I'm now also in the speaker Associ national speaker association. I'm part of taking a training academy on how to focus on your speaker business and how to focus your message and where you want to like all of these things of what other speakers are sharing about their insights and their success. Awesome stuff. So we talked about that. We got caught up in, you know, different things, but the fact that she was willing to give me so much time today was awesome for me because I, I'm a business owner too. I know what, what carving out this much time for an interview can do to a day. So I very much appreciate her, but you're going to really like her because not just because I'm super excited about it, because if you are a business owner that has a team or are thinking about bringing on more people, or for some reason you had to let people go and not just for money reasons, or if you know you have to deal with people, you're going to want to listen to this one all the way through. Kara talks about the culture and we, we get into, you know, running the business and why it's important for people. Like there's so much that we get into and we dive into. I'm not going to tell you anymore. You just need to, you just need to go listen. So here's my interview with Kara Saletto of Magnet Culture. Oh, Kara Saletto, thank you so much for being my guest today on this episode of Small Business Small Talk. In our proverbial green room, everybody, just so you know, Kara and I've known each other for a handful of years now, and I had the distinct pleasure of sitting with her for like an entire day early on in her career and learn all of her little secrets then, and she has grown so much over time. I'm super proud and excited that she said yes, she would do an interview with me. So I want to introduce you guys to Kara Saletto with Magnet Culture. Yay! Hey. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Christy. I'm excited to see your business grow as well. And, you know, we're just out there doing our thing and doing loving what thing. we do. <laughs> and also in, in true transparency, it's taken me that long. So that many years ago when we had that day together, for me to really just get off my ass and hit the button to say, yes, I'm going to focus on my speaking business. And so finally, here we are, we get to reconnect and, and actually, you know, have more conversations more often. And I love being part of the NSA, by the way, that is a great group of people, very supportive of each other. And we're all in the same industry and they're just super supportive. It's kind of new yeah. to me. Yeah, the National Speakers Association has a uh, philosophy that was from Cavett Robert, our founder, and it was that we should not be competitive as much as we should work to make the pie bigger that we're all trying to share. So the more um, good work we do as professional speakers and trainers and coaches and whatnot, the better work we do, the more companies will hire professional speakers and coaches and trainers. And so we're creating more work for all of of us in the end, uh, and particularly with keynotes and speaking, if anyone's thinking about it, right? I know a lot of small businesses that actually use speaking as a marketing tool to speak at industry conferences, get in front of business owners and whatnot. And if you're thinking about doing that type of thing, 
the National Speakers Association is just so great at sharing what the different models are and how to learn from one another because we don't compete very often. If you're going to be a keynoter or even do a breakout session at a conference, they oftentimes don't bring you back the next year. They want somebody new and fresh. So then I can say, hey, I did this gig this year and Christy, you should do it next year. And you could recommend it to your event planner friends and things like that. So yeah, it's really a great group if you want to get more referrals and learn more about the speaking business as well. Absolutely. Okay. So tell me, give me your back, give everybody your backstory because I know a little bit of it, um, but it's so fun to talk about how you grew up into, how did you even want to become a speaker trainer? Yeah, so I started my career as an event planner for a state association, and I was hiring speakers. Now, I had grown up as a theater kid. I was on stage my whole life. My family even had a family band, like the Partridge family, when I was a kid. (laughs) So I've been on stage my whole life performing but then I loved business. So I got a communication degree in undergrad, started doing event planning for the association, and I was hiring speakers. And as I saw these speakers up on the platform, I thought, that is just a one-man show. (laughs) They are up on that platform by themselves with no script, no notes, maybe a PowerPoint, and they are telling stories and they are making people laugh and cry and, you know, walk away inspired and and that type of thing. So when I was in my early twenties, that planted the seed of someday, I think I could do that. I'm going to be on a platform, but at the time I didn't have any credibility or a message or expertise yet. And so then fast forward almost 10 years later, I decided to go out on my own right around age 30. And I was one of the oldest millennials. Everyone around me was complaining about millennials. And at that point, I had also earned my MBA in entrepreneurship. So that taught me to listen to the market, Mm -hmm. listen to what problems people are complaining about, what is costing companies a lot of money. And bridging the generational gaps has been really huge these last 10 years as the workforce has evolved so much. So I started my business about 10 years ago, focusing solely on the generational dynamics in the workplace. And about three to five years in, I realized that the business problem we were solving doing generational work was reducing employee turnover. That if you didn't solve those generational dynamics and you didn't train managers on the millennial mindset and how the workforce is changing, if you didn't teach people about that, then those companies were struggling to get and keep good talent because their managers couldn't manage this new workforce. So in 2015, we rebranded and refocused to all things retention. And since then, you know, a lot of people right now in 2022 think that maybe we jumped on the retention bandwagon because there's a workforce crisis, but we have actually been retention experts for well over five, six years now and have focused solely on why do people leave? Why do people stay? What gets people to stay longer? What makes a great company? What does a good culture actually mean and look like? Those types of things. And then we've built our speaking and training business around that. Now, you've even gone through a, uh, a branding change. So a name change, design change, the whole nine lord, yard, yards, pardon me. Um, <laughs> Because you were, when you started your business, you were Crescendo Strategies, which I love that musical feel to it, right? (laughs) You're just building as a crescendo, but I really want to hear the story of that name change. Like, how did you, how did you just, did you wake up one day and decide, oh, we need a change or you're like, this is no longer serving us. Like what happened? Yeah. So when I started my business, my personal philosophy or passion is helping people and businesses grow. So I also have the musical family background as well. And so I picked that word crescendo, which means to grow in intensity in the music world. I picked that because I thought, well, no matter what I'm doing, whatever specialty I find, I'm going to help people and businesses grow. And crescendo went with that. The imagery and and the analogy there went together. Well, then Fast forward to when we 
I, I say we rebranded in 2015, but we didn't change our company name. We just changed our slogan to we reduce unnecessary employee turnover. And once we did that and we focused more on turnover, we were getting that type of work. And honestly, a few years into the business, I realized people could not say spell or remember the word crescendo. (laughs) It was just too, you know, especially for people that didn't have a musical background, it was too odd. If you know the spelling of crescendo, C-R-E-S-C-E-N-D-O. So people would say crescendo, crescendo, like they would just make up all kinds of ways to say it. When I was speaking as a keynoter, um, people would butcher it. They would say it all wrong. And I just was like, oh, nobody's going to know my company name, (laughs) you know, and I even had friends and family that couldn't, after me being in business five plus years, they couldn't remember the name of my business. They would just say, oh, you know, Kara's business. And they couldn't remember the name of it. And so probably 2017, 2018, going into 2019, I knew we needed to completely rename and rebrand to something a little more memorable or easy to remember. But also because we had focused at that point on retention, crescendo and growth didn't directly align with retention. Uh, and keeping people. And we had been using, when I wrote my book in 2018 about retention, we had an acronym called MAGNET, M-A-G-N-E-T, about being a magnet employer, one that attracts versus repels talent. And so we'd been using the word magnet for years. And when the pandemic hit in 2020, I needed to keep my staff busy with something because we weren't training and speaking at that point. Uh, Not very much anyway, a little bit of virtual, but a lot of stuff got postponed. So in order to keep my staff productive, I said, okay, great. Now's the perfect time. We have some downtime at our offices. I'm not out traveling. Let's do the full rebrand. And so we knew we wanted to use the word magnet because it was a much better representation of the retention work we do. But we we toyed with magnet retention, magnet leadership, magnet consulting, different things like that. And I'll tell you, five years ago, I never would have picked the word culture. Our, our company name now is Magnet Culture. And I never would have picked the word culture five years ago because five years ago, CEOs still thought culture was fluffy. They still didn't wow. take it seriously as a as an executive conversation and priority in their business. And um, <clears throat> something changed, you know, the late 2019s and now going into 2020, every CEO is talking about culture now and how important it is. And Peter Drucker, a famous business book author, he he had a famous quote that said, Stra- or culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yep. <laughs> Right. And I think once he said that and more CEOs read his books and saw that they realized, holy moly, we're not going to be able to keep our people if we don't care and we don't define who we are and what makes us tick and help our staff make a difference in their lives and our, in our company and things like that. So it's beautiful for me. I'm like, you can be strategic with culture. Yes. (laughs) Oh, you have to be now your culture better be a part of your executive conversation Uh and a part of your budget. Are you training your managers to be the people that you want them to be as you know, your culture really is the way you treat your people. And the way your people treat your people, (laughs) that's the true culture. When I come to work every day, how am I treated? Um, That's that's it. And so many companies cut training and development for their managers years ago, trying to be lean and do more with less. And nobody's got time for that. And now it's come back to haunt them because they have a culture that is just get it done, get it done, do more with less, do more with less. And nobody has time. Just stay and, till the job gets done. Many people are like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So yeah, that's the story behind magnet culture. And our brand has always been purple, but magnets are traditionally red, you know, a, a standard magnet. And so our new logo is actually a purple and red magnet coming together, almost like the older traditional way of doing things and a more um, traditional mindset and traditional approach 
going along with, in a successful way, the millennial mindset and a more progressive approach about how we work, where we work, when we work, all of those things. So it's a nice blend of, of old school and new school together. I love that you have so much excitement around it. Like <laughs> this is not a, oh, we decided to do this. Like you, your energy is definitely coming through extremely well. And I love that, which I already knew that about you, but I just want to make sure everybody's, are you noticing how excited she still is <laughs> about this change in her business and where it's going? And like that kind of excitement then is a ripple effect into all of the clients that you have, all of the associations you've talked to over the years, even your team, because I know your team just absolutely adores you mm -hmm. and just, right. You guys have pulled together in it. And during 2020, that was two years ago already. Can you believe mm -hmm. that? That's crazy. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't. <laughs> there are still days 2020 just didn't exist um, for me. It was like, oh, wait, no, that was pre-pandemic. Now we're here. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, there was that one year <laughs> where nothing seemed to happen, but like you said, there, there wasn't a lot coming in for you revenue wise during right. that year. Um, and the fact that you were like, Nope, we're going to be productive. Now's a great time. Like you took, you took what could have been totally destructive for your business mm -hmm. and turned it into a positive, innovative change that just makes so much sense for the marketplace. Right. Yeah. So we focus on employee retention and culture, and I have to practice what I preach. And I know that anytime you do layoffs, for example, that is going to taint the trust that employees have, not only right now, but for years to come. You will get interviewees that are going to ask you, how did you handle 2020? Did you let all your people go? Or did you keep your people, you know, and of course it depends on your business, right? There were certain industries that had no other options, yeah. but to lay off or furlough their people. I'm not trying to be judgy, but in my business of training and development, I knew that I needed my talent when we would come out of the pandemic or when the shutdown of not having training was going to be uplifted. So I really didn't want to let go of any of the people that know me, know my stuff, know, you know, our team and our processes and our clients and things like that, because I also realized that, or, or predicted, I guess, that as we came out of the pandemic, workforce was going to be one of the top issues yep. because I could see people reprioritizing their lives and reprioritizing work and life balance and different things like that. And so we kind of doubled down and said, we need to ramp up for 2021 and 2022. And so in 2020, we lost almost half of our revenue from the prior year, from 2019, but I kept everybody employed and working on special projects, even outside of their job. They were working on things that had nothing to do with their job description, uh, but we went and got women-owned certified. We built an online course. We started licensing our online course and our video products out to other uh, learning platforms and things like that. We went after some government contracting, which we had never done before. I mean, I did in a previous life, so I kind of sure. knew how that worked, but my company had never done any government contracting. Honestly, we didn't have time. It's a lot of research. It's a lot of application and talked jumping about the capacity through. in the green room. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. So jumping much. through who? Oops, like I didn't, that was sitting on the back burner. I knew about some government contracts that we would totally qualify for and be able to get, but nobody on my team had time until 2020. So then when 2020 hit, we just really looked at our whole wish list of projects, including the rebrand, right? That's what my marketing team spent six or eight months on. And so we just said, all right, if we're going to stay employed, we have to be productive. We've got to crank out new products and new things. They were not selling in 2020. What we were doing is we were building out our product line for 2021. And we were just looking ahead at what are people going to need in 18 months? You know, nobody knew how long the pandemic was going to impact our industries and our businesses. 
but we pivoted as best we could at the time. We built a virtual HD studio so we could do still training and speaking uh, live virtual or pre-recorded. You know, all the speakers and trainers did that. But then we thought, okay, what are we going to offer next year? What are the new classes, new keynotes, new things that we need to do? So we just busted our tail in 2020. Again, we lost about half of our revenue, but we were able to get the PPP. We even got a state-specific grant that was similar to the PPP that helped us as well to pay payroll and all that fun stuff. And we had a financial cushion. I'm a big believer in having your financial cushion for a rainy day. And thank goodness we did, (laughs) because that's what we lived off of until the PPP came through and and helped us keep people even longer. As you know, it lasted a lot longer than we thought it was going to. But then here's the, here's the, the end of that story. 2021, we doubled our revenue from 2019. I know, right. I we we I not only message that was like, yes, yes, we not only, you know, made up for the lost revenue from 2020, but we actually came in far ahead of where we thought we would be. And it was because of the government contracts we went after, the licensing deals we went after, new products that we had created and shifting from just selling live training over to video based training programs and virtual and and those types of things. So uh, just really thinking ahead, staying productive, hustling. We we probably worked harder in 2020 than we ever work. I mean, just go, 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 go. What's next? What's next? What's next? Because I felt like to keep my people employed, we had to have productivity. I couldn't just have them sitting and taking a paycheck, but as long as they were building and working on relationships or something productive, then it made sense to me. And thank goodness it all paid off in the end. (laughs) Well, I love, I love everything about that because there's so much that there's so much that we could just like pick one thing and unpack it. Um, But really what I want to ask you next is more about Kara in her business Like, what do you love most about what you do? Yeah, so um, of course I have a passion for being on the stage and doing keynotes and, and training. I have learned now that I love more than anything working with the executive team and the the top leadership or the owners and that level of workers because um there's so much personal connection to the company with those people that are higher up. And so they're so tied to the way it's always been done. They're not necessarily rigid. Some are, some are not. <laughs> it's not that they haven't evolved, but they're, they have so much history in the prior success the company had and, and things like that. And so now, particularly when you have the younger workers who don't have the same relationship with the business. The employer-employee relationship is very different today than it was 20 years ago with people who who felt more obligated or more commitment, more loyalty. You know, a lot of people use those words, but it's just a different relationship between the employer and the employees today. And so I love working with the senior leadership to make sure that they are continuing to evolve and have the right mindset that is magnetic and that people want to work for that company and that they're setting the right tone and that they realize they need to, they must invest in the managers and supervisors for them to create a department that people want to work in and be a boss that people want to work for. So I work more with the executive teams now and the ownership teams, but I have a training team that's magnificent and they are the ones who go out and teach our workforce retention boot camp and our training classes on emotional intelligence and disc behaviors and different things like that. So so we do the training at all levels, but I have found personally I love working with the top leadership and then I really love running the company. 
I love sitting behind my desk and and playing CEO of of the company because I'm one of those weird people that's like 50% left brain, right brain. So as much as I love to tell a story and write a new program, you know, create something new, I also love working on the budget and the P&L and spreadsheets and, you know, crunching the numbers of the new programs and what is the, what's the price point going to be? And then turn around and work on the marketing. Okay, well, who's our target market and, and things like that. So I think because of that entrepreneurial MBA that I got, I, I got a taste of operations, finance, accounting, marketing, <laughs> you know, all of that stuff. So I have a great team in place and my job as CEO is to be the visionary and to provide guidance of who we are, where we're headed and some ideas, you know, be very forward thinking and and predictive in what's coming next with the market. And then once I set that vision with my team, I let them do their brilliant jobs at marketing and finance and operations and whatnot. And I turn into a support role. So then I ask my team, how can I help you? What do you need? Right? So my, my finance person, my marketing person, they'll set the meetings to talk about the budget, the target market and whatnot. And I just get to be a part of that conversation and take their lead oftentimes if they've got ideas for campaigns and plans. And then for me, they'll turn around and say, okay, I need you to write a blog about this, or I need you to write an article because this magazine, you know, I got this magazine to accept a submission from you. And now I need the article (laughs) because the marketing team doesn't write it for me. Right. I have to still do that. So yes, I love being the visionary and then stepping back and saying, okay, there's the vision. Now, how do I help my team get us there? Uh, you and I are very similar in a lot of ways because that's that's how we're functioning over here, which is mm-hmm. exciting for me to experience it too. Because you know, first of all, I'm not I'm no longer the one man shop, right? Having the team brings in a totally different dynamic. And I already knew ahead of time I need to continually be putting into my people, and so that they feel they feel like they can be themselves mm-hmm. while sharing with this person and her company, (laughs) all of their gifts and, and themselves, like they are completely free to be themselves while sharing all that with me to make my business better in the marketplace. And I was like, I love this, this dynamic. That's amazing that they're willing to pick me as their employer. Mm Mm-hmm. That's the right attitude too. They picked you, right? It isn't they're lucky to have this job. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm lucky to have somebody help me get the work done because otherwise I know what it's like to have to do all of the things and all the things. All of the things. <laughs> I mean, there's multiple whiteboards of things that I do in the business. And I'm like, oh no, this person would be great at that. This person would be great at that because they're already sharing their gifts and talents. Mm -hmm. They may just need some training on here's how, here's what's in Christy's head. Yep. Here's how to think like Christy wants. And I just had one of my team members. She's like, you know, I've learned you over the time. Now that I know what you like, it doesn't take me near as long to get something done. And I'm like, wow, that was Uh great. (laughs) (laughs) And my team is also fantastic. I just, they, they're great. Mm -hmm. They're great. And they're all different. We're all different generations. So I'm, I'm an ex, I have a millennial and I have, uh, she's the cusp of a very, very young. Yes. Cause she's in her twenties. Yep. (laughs) So I've got the the twenties and the thirties and the forties here. And I'm like, Oh, look at us go. go. (laughs) You know, a new thing that we have just done. I'm not sure how many folks that are listening are familiar with it, but there's a book called traction. And it is all about how you run your business, really creating a well-oiled machine so that you can get more traction, so you can scale better and faster and replace people faster and, you know, easier and things like that. And that's what, that's what our big project is this year for 2022, even though we're a small business and traction is usually meant for a little bit bigger businesses, you know, medium sized businesses, but just reading the book and walking with my leadership team through, you know, do we have the right people in the right seats and 
it, it is too much on my plate. Because when you say like, what does Kara love to do? Okay, well, I still want to be the deliverable and go out and do our executive retreats. But then I still want to be the writer and creator of things. But then I still want to be involved with the business and finance and, you know, and, and it ends up being too many things. So we have an org chart and yet traction is making us rethink the org chart and not just who has what skills, but the capacity piece of it. You right. cannot put too much stuff on one person's plate or they will not be successful in those roles. So we're learning that internally, what some of our bottlenecks are and, and the capacity constraints that we have. And I also talk about that with our clients when talking about workforce retention, because we have overloaded most of our staff and particularly the managers that we've put in place, we've completely overloaded them with do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Oh, and by the way, you've got these people to manage as well. And I know you don't really have time for that because you have this and this and this and this and this to do, but they need your help. Oh, and then one of them just quit. So now you need to find a new one, onboard them, train them, mentor them, while you're still doing this and this and this and this and this, and don't let any of the others feel like you don't have time for them or they'll quit too, <laughs> right? It's like this never ending cycle, vicious circle of the, the death spiral of turnover, we call it once you get into that. So oh, I'm sure, yeah. It's uh, workloads is a big, big thing that I'm focusing on both with my clients and with my staff. In fact, my staff, even the salary staff, this may sound crazy, but even my salary staff, I have them clock their hours because I don't want anybody to work more than 40 hours a week. And, uh, you know, un unless there truly is like an all hands on deck, one time, one week thing that I need their help with. But we've gotten into the habit where now salary people over time is just expected and totally normal. And that's part of why people are quitting. They, it's not normal. It shouldn't be normal. It wasn't normal 20 or 30 years ago. Over time for hourly or salary people was temporary. It was, hey, we're seasonal or we have this big project we've got to get done. So let's, you know, boost and get it done. And then our schedules will go back to normal. And now over the last 20 to 30 years, we just kept creeping up and up and up and up. And now people think 50, 60 hours a week is normal. It is not. It is not. Even as a business owner, I do not work. And now I have to travel. So that's a little weird uh, figuring that into my calendar. But if, if I'm home, I am nine to five Monday through Friday. And I do not work nights and weekends. I spend time with my kid. And I'm very compartmentalized. Don't bother me during work if you are not work related. <laughs> And do not bother me at home nights and weekends if you are work related <laughs> as best as I can, right? So as long as I plan ahead and I hit all my deadlines ahead of schedule, then I'm not scrambling on the weekends and at nights to do that. And I'm hyper sensitive and hyper focused on my staff and my workloads so that we don't have to, you know, work a lot of overtime. I know one of my goals for me and my team is to work part-time hours for full-time pay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's it's doable if you put the right well, processes the in place. <laughs> it is part of the overall strategic plan. Yeah. Um, and they know that they know that I'm very intent on that because we should all be able to play a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been one of my challenges of the years is I'm that 80 hours a week person because I don't have a kid. I don't have any, any of the other things that says, you should not work. And so I've been working on that with myself the past couple of years. And I'm like, I'm finally at a point where I, I could take a nap on the weekends and not feel guilty about it. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> so we initially started this conversation about the NSA and about how, how we learn from other people. And there's these are wonderful people over the years. And it doesn't even have to be from NSA, but over the years, what is some of the best pieces of advice or a piece of advice you've ever received? Mm, best pieces of advice I've ever received. Um, I think a few things that I, that I live by today that somebody said to me, and I wish I could remember who these people were, but one is done is better than perfect. Oh uh, yeah. And so when I'm building something new, 
I'm a continuous improvement kind of person. So it doesn't have to be perfect the first go round um, because I'm going to continue to evolve it. Right. And that goes hand in hand with another mantra that somebody taught me that I also live by is sell it, then build it. So when we're launching a new training program, all I have to come up with is the outline, the skeleton of what that program will look like. I don't have to actually go in and build my PowerPoints and build the classroom discussion and activities. And I don't have to have all the details of exactly what's going to be covered. All I need to have is the sexy title for marketing, the description of what it covers, you know, what what it's about, and the learning objectives. What are you going to walk away from that class knowing? And then we can back ourselves into the actual content of the program after somebody buys it. Because a lot of times as small businesses, we think, oh, it's got to be perfect and I have to have it all fleshed out before I can sell something. And I, I don't feel that way, at least not in our business. Um, now, you don't want to promise something you can't deliver. <laughs> so you have to be you have to be careful that you're not over promising and that it is within your wheelhouse and timing capacity, right, of what you can actually deliver. But, um, but I think those have been some of them and solve a business problem, right? That's a big piece of it is don't just try to sell what you love and what you're passionate about. But instead, what is a business problem that people have or a personal problem, right? If you sell con- to consumers B2C instead of B2B, what is a problem people have or a gap in their life that you can fill? Um, and that's how we focus our marketing and things like that as well. So and that's I really a great thing tips. that you love to do is solving their problem. Yes. But when you focus on defining that problem first, mm-hmm. and if like that, cause I had to come into it that way with the whole being super. We talked about that too yes. in the green room is that I like, everybody needs to read this book. It's great for everybody, but what problem does this, this whole concept, this content solve for the reader and who needs to read it the most. And so exactly. backing into that as a training, now I've got it. These are the problems this thing is solving. Yes. Oh, and it, and it did make me feel so much better to get that problem defined and how this thing is solving the problem. And then I was like, oh, wow. Why did it take five years to get to this point? (laughs) I got there. It took me a while, but I got there. Um, That was, I mean, that that's a moment of success for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was accomplishment. So as we wrap up our, our interview today, I, I ask everybody, what does success mean to you? Oh, that's a great question because it is different for everyone. Um, success for me is peace. It's, it is peace in, in life in, um, that I, that I have downtime, that I have wiggle room, that I, am not always scrambling, that to me would be the opposite of peace and the opposite of success. If I was, okay, go, 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 go. Even though I'm an introvert, I'm a very high energy person. I love, you know, talking to people and going places and having play dates and all of that stuff. In fact, I prefer play dates over sitting by myself. Okay. So like, I love to be around people, but being on that play date and being with my friends, that is peace to me. I'm not scrambling. I'm not, Oh, I got to do the laundry. Oh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, you know, feeling like I'm two steps behind all the time and I should be doing this and I should be doing that. Right. And feeling guilty. I I hate to feel guilty that I took a nap or that I didn't get that done by five o'clock or whatever it was. So to me, peace is the goal. Peace is the success. And to get there, a lot of times I am doing more delegation, (laughs) getting more off my plate, um, spending more time with my son, my husband, my friends, my family, that type of thing. Um, I love my job. Absolutely love my job, living the dream, doing what I do. But I'm really happy to close my laptop by 515 and have my family time and my peace at home Um, and also not have dishes and laundry and stuff yelling at me. I keep everything on a schedule. 
And I know I do laundry on Sundays. So laundry is never barking at me Monday through Saturday because I keep it on a schedule. And that is more peaceful for me. Very peaceful. I love, love that part of my life. <laughs> so laundry days are success days. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's great. And I don't mind doing it that I know going into it on Sunday, it's laundry day. I crank out as many loads as I can. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I just don't think about it the other days of the week because it's very compartmentalized and very scheduled, which is, and it's, which is great for, for others. And I will say one, one last note for me, your son really is adorable. I get to see him grow up on Facebook and I'm like the, the hijinks he gets into is great. <laughs> oh yeah. He's a little performer chip off the old block. And uh, he is so much fun sings and dances and does his ninja moves and you know, <laughs> He's, he's hilarious. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> well done, mom. <laughs> well, Karen, yeah. thank you so much for being my guest today on this episode of small business, small talk. I love it. Love you. Yeah, thanks for time. having me. <laughs> so did you catch all of that? There was a lot that we packed into this interview session on this episode and just so much good meaty nuggets in there. Just gold to mine for days when this conversation with Kara. Now, what I liked the most is that she really did share. She shared her um, insights, like the best advice that she's gotten and what those things look like. And, and I totally get it, man. What is the problem that you're solving? She actually spoke to one of our groups recently um, for the speaker Academy about, you know, what's the problem that your thing is solving that affects their PL. And that that one extra piece of information within that changed my paradigm, my thinking on, oh, it's not just a problem. It's not just a thing that upsets them. It's not just the frustration. It's how does it affect the PL? How is it showing up as a line item in the business that they, or is it not? Like, have they not even paid attention? So this is where that miscellaneous charge is happening. This is why it's so expensive for hiring people or whatever the case may be. And then I love that her version of success is peace. Just let's think about it. In the world that we're in today, based on the experience that we've gone through in 2020 and the world today, wouldn't that really be something? That is a high level of that, like that is the ultimate thing to strive for is peace. And she has called it success. I love that. That just changes a lot of things. So think about your own version of success. What does that mean to you? You know, what does the, what does the quote unquote world tell you? What does the media tell you success actually is? What have you been grown up to think that success needs to be? And what is it really for you? This is why I ask this question to all of my people I interview, because it's that important to change the paradigm of what we think success really is. We can have small successful moments, and then there's the ultimate goal of success. And when you've hit that success, when you have that moment of success of your definition, you need to stop breathing in and celebrate in that moment to remind yourself that yes, because of this, I am successful. I am having these successful moments. What about me made this successful? I just made a really good strategic decision. I just delegated this to a well-qualified team member who really appreciates where this business is going. That was successful. I'm at peace. I can compartmentalize my days. I can structure things differently. That's successful. I'm at peace. That's success. Like this is, I love these things that she talked about. So I, I hope that you took a lot of notes because that one was noteworthy, totally noteworthy, <laughs> both musically and <laughs> for your business. Um, plus I love that she just comes from a musical background. That's one of my favorite parts too. Uh, both of us love to be on stage. Like there's just a lot of similarities with me and Kara. She's just way ahead of me in this game for, you know, life conditions, circumstances, situations. I've made different decisions. She's just, she's brilliant. She is brilliant. 
And I love that she was my guest today. So I hope that you loved her as well. And as a reminder, if you haven't already, you can subscribe to us on YouTube or Spotify or you know, find us on that listening uh, channel that you prefer. And if nothing else, just go to smallbusinessmalltalk.com and you can check out all of the back episodes all of the information there, show notes, links to all of our guests, that kind of stuff. It's all at that main website. And I believe we have comment forms ready now. If not, just let me know, like connect with me socially and uh, let me know what you think of the, of this. Leave us a review on those channels, uh, iTunes, Google, YouTube, Spotify, yeah, all of the things, all of the things. Let us know what you think. Give us a great review. Help us to keep this podcast, this episode, these shows of Small Business, Small Talk going. And honestly, you know, I had a thought one day. I know this is totally random, but I would love to turn this into like a real TV show. Like how awesome would it be to actually show off my guests' businesses in such a great way? Like more video, not just the interview style, but like really show them off. Um, that's going to take a production crew. So I'm just throwing it out, out into the universe now. That's, I think that's where I'd love, love to be. So we're going to mark that this day because that would be an awesome place to get to. All right. With that, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Small Business Small Talk. I have here been your host, Christy Smallwood. Mm-hmm.